Hello. Um, the last topic on paper two or component two is the relationship between the branches. And to some extent, we've covered some of these already. Um, the essay for Wednesday was about the location of sovereignty. We've pretty much covered it. The relationship between the executive and parliament is a bit of overlap there. What you do with Miss Brown and with Miss Brown, you do the relationship between essentially Parliament, mostly the Executive and just the Supreme Court. Um, so the last one of those, the one we're going to look at this week, is the role, AIM's role and impact of the EU, which may be an odd one as to why we're studying it, because we're leaving the EU. Uh, but the syllabus was written 2012, so we were still in the EU. Um, leaving the EU was a pipe dream for some Eurosceptics back then. Uh, and also the exam board has sent out guidance recently that said until they're instructed to take it out of, of the syllabus, uh, we still need to study it. Plus, we will also have relations with the EU um, even after uh, it has gone through and if things have changed. So this is just to do a, a brief introduction or background to the, the UK and the EU. So at the moment, the EU has um, 28 countries in it, um, some willing to join, um, but it has increased very much since it was originally started back in um, the, the late 50s. Uh, what was the rationale for the EU? Well, we have a slightly different perspective in the UK, but from the continental European perspective, you must remember that um, European wars occurred on the continent of Europe pretty much every generation from the 19th century. You had the Napoleonic Wars, which of course finished in 1815 with, with Waterloo and then the Congress of Vienna. So you had a long period of, of by and large, stability. Um, but then 1870, you had the, the Franco-Prussian War, which was the nascent German state uh, invaded and defeated France. And then uh, um, 40 or so odd years later, you had the First World War, France and Germany again. And then you had um, 39 to 45, of course, Second World War. Um, so until you had aerial bombing, really, the, the UK mainland didn't really suffer from these these huge wars um, in terms of devastation. Um, but each of the time the wars are increasing in intensity. So after the, the last major war, um, they decided they were trying going to prevent future conflict and particularly conflict over resources. So in 1951, the Treaty of Paris established the European Coal and Steel Community and six countries signed the treaty that they would share these resources. The argument being that if there isn't conflict over resources, plus if the countries work together, they get to know each other, um, less likely to go to war with each other. So six countries signed the treaty, France, Germany and the Benelux countries, Belgium, Holland and Luxembourg and Italy. Um, and then since then, there's been increasing moves towards what we see is called more integration and more enlargement as well. Um, six years after that, the Treaty of Rome led to the creation of the European Economic Community. Um, and the aim was to increase economic integration between the states. And it was originally conceived as a, a free trade area, the European Economic Community. Um, UK joins in 1st of January 1973. And subsequent to that, the EEC has evolved into what we now call the European Union and several major treaties impact on how the UK is governed. And again, these are one of the sources of the Constitution. Significant one is the Single European Treaty, um, laid the basis for the single market. It introduced this thing called qualified majority voting, which we'll look at in the next video. Um, and the first commitment by member states to create a European Union. Maastricht Treaty, the one that the major governments um, hit the rocks on, um, formally created the EU, but also laid the foundation for the Eurozone, which of course um, the UK didn't join. Then you have the Lisbon Treaty, which continued the process of extend, extending and enlarging the powers of the EU. Um, so in summary then, as, as the EU developed over time, it changed from a purely economic union, um, uh, to encompass a political union. So it moved from the European Economic Community to a European Union. And it now has its own parliament, civil service, ministers, etc. With the EU expanding the areas from its member states over which the EU has jurisdiction. And the EU calls those areas areas in which it has competence. Your skeptics will say these are areas in which countries have lost sovereignty. So this 
process by which the EU expands the areas over which it has competence over is known as integration. Um, but integration has also been accompanied by a process of enlargement. So we've gone from the original six up to the current 28. So some, you could say on one extreme, would also like to continue pushing for greater political union. In effect, a federal style Europe with a, a single dominant European government. I mean, the nation states will still have uh, their own parliaments, legislatures, or whatever, but they would lose much of their individual autonomy and sovereignty. And many at the start of the EU had this vision, and there's always been a, a strong core, often the people who are closely involved with the EU institutions who are federalists, they're unashamed federalists, they would like the EU to move to ever greater political union. Others, such as some in the UK and other countries, interestingly, when the UK leaves, lots of other countries who are, had lots of um, reservations about it, were able to keep their mouth shut because the UK was always the awkward partner and the UK would always be able to speak up and they could um, get away with holding their breath. But now the UK is gone, some of these countries would be interesting to see if they will um, be now forced to speak up about their reservations. But some such as those in the UK would have liked to see less political union, less integration, arguing that we had given up too much sovereignty and wanted to return to a more emphasis on the original concept of a free trade area. Um, so European Union enlarged from six to 28 and you can see big uh, enlargement was 2004, which is enlarged eastwards and also northern as well. Um, what's the, the, the rationale, you could argument you could make for this enlargement and integration? Well, if you look back historically in the UK, you started off with various tribes, I suppose you would say, scattered around, and then they coalesce into various regions ruled by regional kings, where smaller groupings coalesce into larger groupings to increase their power and influence. And then those groupings coalesce into a larger area, you can call it England, then England subsumes Wales, then Scotland with the Act of Union. So there is this tendency historically for smaller groupings to group together, obviously partly for imperial reasons, if you like, but also that larger groupings used to have more clout, more power and more influence. And this was a, a global phenomenon. The 19th century had this burst of um, nationalism, nation building, and then it happened again after the Soviet Union broke down. So in one way you can look at a global map and you can see this is what the world looks like, this world of by and large independent nation states competing against each other. However, some people would say, well, that's not really what the map of the world looks like. It's more like this, where you have these large um, economic blocks, if you like, and these are the big um, trading organisations um, that compete against each other and how can one small little island off the coast of Europe, and this map is really not to scale, I mean the UK would be much much smaller, how can it compete by itself against these big trading blocks? So the argument would be that you would coalesce into a larger block so therefore you can punch above your weight and you can have more influence. So this larger block, the EU, um, can negotiate as a block and it has much more influence against other big large areas as opposed to any individual country hiving off. So that was the kind of rationale as they go forward. It does mean of course or it did mean that these individual countries had to integrate more to, to give themselves not just an internal uh, uniformity in terms of trading standards and trading area but also to allow these bodies in the EU to speak for them. Um, so it can be argued that much of the pressure for increased cooperation and union comes from global forces. Can any of these relatively small European economies compete globally in the face of you know, the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, China and India? Part of the quid pro quo for that is, of course, you have to give up some of sovereignty in some areas. But the positive term used to describe what has happened is that we haven't given up our sovereignty. We have merely pooled our sovereignty with the other countries in order to make ourselves stronger. So this idea of pooled sovereignty is the combination of national sovereignties of member states to enhance their power and influence. The argument being that the whole is, is greater or more influential than some of the parts such as in the EU. So this would be the, the positive spin that pro-Europeans would put on it. We haven't lost sovereignty, we've pooled it. Pooled sovereignty is not 
hadn't been uncontroversial. Um, Eurosceptics would always maintain that you know it wasn't there in the original aspect of the EEC, and really it was introduced to, uh, through the back door as the European Union expanded or the EEC gave way to the EU. Uh, as we will see, many of the institutions that exercise this pooled sovereignty um, are supranational and they're not democratically accountable, they're not transparent. This idea that there's a democratic deficit in the EU. Um, pooled sovereignty is not pooled equally with some countries. Some, let's be fair, Germany is the most powerful country in the EU, what Germany wants, Germany gets. There's some documentaries on about the EU. If you watch episode two of that, you can see that everything revolves around what Germany wanted. And of course, pooled sovereignty is contradictory to national sovereignty and under qualified majority voting. Even large member states like the UK could have been outvoted by a combination of other states. And a kind of cultural thing, pool sovereignty is based on the assumption that we all have a common culture within the EU and one size fits all, but really that's not the case. So what were those areas that we did pool our sovereignty? Well, these are the areas in which we had largely passed over jurisdiction, competence, whatever you want to call it, over to the EU. So uh, these areas were controlled by the EU. The second block are the areas that we still retained sovereignty that the EU did not make legislation for or didn't interfere with. And then this third block was an interesting one, areas in which you didn't pass over jurisdiction, but it's very hard to make decisions in these areas without some reference to the, to the EU. For example, environmental protection doesn't make sense to do it as an individual country because um, environmental and climate change doesn't stop at national borders. So post-Brexit then we are taking back control, hey, that's a nice phrase, of these areas. Um, and uh, this is the idea of the whole by take back control. Um, however, because of the nature of where we are, our relationship with the EU, we're still going to have some kind of, of close relationship with the EU. Um, so in summary, then what ways has EU membership impacted on the, the UK? Well, several policy areas were are still under EU jurisdiction trade fishing, uh, where jurisdictional competence had been passed over, pooled. EU laws were superior to UK laws, and we looked at that in the Factor 10 case. In those areas we had passed over sovereignty, um, EU law was superior. Um, majority of trade was and still is carried out with EU. Um, EU is enabled to protect its industries from foreign competition. Um, no restrictions on the movement of people, leading to increased immigration. As we see, that was one of the four freedoms of the EU. Uh, EU workers were protected by the social chapter. There were new rights and entitlements to workers, which is the kind of emphasis Corbyn had, and um, people on the left have um, joined the Brexit referendum. And also UK farming and agriculture got a lot more from the EU, arguably, than they put in. Um, finally, um, for historical and cultural and political reasons then, um, the UK has always been seen as the awkward partner in the EU. Even though we joined, we were never fully committed, we joined late. Culturally, Britain has this legacy of, of uh, imperial power and doesn't really like to see itself as just another player in a bigger group. Um, and the EU generally has been opposed to continued expansion and integration and we were seen as the awkward partner. And then, as we all know, driven by the, the rise of UKIP and the continuing divisions within the Conservative Party, which also had a cure group of your respectives. Cameron promised UK an in-out referendum, and which he thought he would win, and then 2016 the referendum was passed, and now we're in the process of extricating ourselves from the EU. Um, next video then, we're going to look at some of the key terms that you're going to come across as you're studying the EU on the pre-tude and through the textbook as well.